Welcome to another podcast of Living a Full Life. I am Dr. Enrico Dolcicori, and I'll be your host this week. This week's podcast is about longevity. How do we live to 100 years old with a good quality of life? Many people that I talk to and I joke about, you know, we're going to keep you healthy till 100 are like, oh, I don't know if I want to live to 100. I barely feel good at 60. I don't want to make it to 100. And, and they joke around about how, you know, if this is how they feel now, they definitely don't want to make it to 100. And at the end of the day, that's kind of sad. It's kind of sad to think, hey, you know, if it's this hard now, why would I want to make it to any type of age goal? And number two, I can't control how long I'm going to live either uh, because everything comes to an end. So we understand those things. But I thought it was a little odd that... Um, that was the the kind of philosophy around people these days is that, yeah, man, if I feel like this now, I don't know if I want to make it to, to 100. And growing up around my European family, it was always like, I've signed, a, I've signed an agreement that I'm going to make it to 150, you know, and they joke around about wanting to live long. So it's kind of odd the way we think about that. And it all comes down to today and the things we do today, not only to help us live a high quality of life today, but empower us to have those habits carry us forward into the future. And of course, we can't control how long we live, but what can we do to live to 100 years old? This is a, this is a great topic, and we could probably do tons of podcasts on this, but <clears throat> it's going to come from understanding what we know now. Where on earth do people live long, healthy lives where at 100 years old, they're still walking and talking and cognitive and their memory's good? and playing bocce and or whatever it may be walking and going for walks and and talking to their pets and taking care of the garden i think those are the things we want to do and if we thought that way we'd be like well yeah if i could do all that i would want to live to 100 what are the things we can do it's going to be studying the blue zones really these are blue these are zones around the world where they have the highest percentage of centarians meaning people who live to 100 plus in the world the densest areas of uh, per capita of people making it to 100 years old and above. And and they're in a unique pattern closer to the equator, um, but from all over the world. There's uh, Okinawa, Japan. There is Sardinia in Italy, where some of my family's at. There's uh, Nicoya in, in Costa Rica, Ikara in Greece. That's the other half of my family. And Loma Linda in California. That's an interesting one. We'll talk about California because that's the closest one to us <clears throat> here. But these blue zones have shown multiple things that these groups of people do throughout their life that may be tied to the reasons why they live so long. But let's go to the basis of life and longevity. And it's about how long you live and how healthy you can make it as well. And genetics play a big role. Let's let's not forget genetics. We like to handcuff genetics and, and blame our genetics for where we are today. And we say things like, well, you know, obesity runs in my family or diabetes runs in my family or cancer runs in my family. And, and, and as a healthcare provider, we look at history to predict things that may happen and to alter lifestyle to prevent those things from happening genetically. And with successful prevention, you can prevent diseases from happening, even though they run genetically in the family. And when we follow families through research and through studies, not everyone in the family gets the same diseases, or some of them may not get any of those diseases. So if genetics were a clear-cut definition of what's going to happen in the future, then there would be no use doing anything. But they're not. We can change our genetics. And we know that now because most of the new <clears throat> university and college courses on genetics is all about epigenetics, the possibility and the how we change gene markers to express the underlying genetic material. Very cool stuff there on longevity. So yes, genetics play a huge role, but even bigger is the lifestyle, how we live our life that can turn genes on and off. Very cool stuff. And I could nerd out about epigenetics. Maybe we should do that someday. Lifestyle plays a huge role. Our environment also plays a huge role. These are things we can actually control. We think, well, hey, Dr. D, we live on Earth. We can't control that. No, of course, we all live on Earth. We can't control Earth. But we can control where we live and what we do. If we live in a highly polluted area, a highly polluted city, might be a good idea to start planning on moving your family somewhere else. 
Some of us can do that. Some of us can't. Obviously, I'm talking from the North America right now where we have those luxuries where we're like, hey, I'm moving across the country. Um, other parts of the world, they can barely li- leave their neighborhood. So it all depends on where we're at. So eating a healthy diet plays a huge role. Uh, don't smoke at all, you know, exercise, limiting alcohol, getting enough sleep and managing stress. The reason why I run through those, it's because I sound like I'm on repeat with all these podcasts that we do, but let's get into the blue zones. That's the cool part about all this. What are those people doing in Italy, in Costa Rica, in Loma Linda, California? What are they doing in Okinawa that makes such a huge percentage of them live to a hundred with such good lifestyles? It's a plant-based diet. This does not mean vegetarianism or veganism. It means heavily being vegetarian, but not exclusively to that. It's a heavy-based plant diet. So people in blue zones typically eat a diet that's high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. They also eat a small amount of meat and fish. So there you go. No veganism, no vegetarianism in those places. So a lot of those diets seem to like to show the benefits of that. But when it comes to longevity, the studies actually say meat and fish in small quantities actually play a major role in longevity because there's protein and amino acid branches that you cannot get anywhere else. All right. Plant-based diet, it makes up 80 plus percent of their diet. Remember that regular physical activity. They all have regular physical activity. And what does this mean in Costa Rica and Okinawa and Ikara? I'll tell you right now in Ikara, there's not uh, gyms, you know, there's no crunch fitnesses all over on every corner. They, They don't do that. The Greeks are not going to the gyms, especially on those islands. What they're doing is they're going for walks, gardening, and doing other activities that elevate their heart rate. So they're working outside. They're tending to their gardens, they're tending to their farms, they're tending to their olive patches, they're tending to their vines, they're tending to um, outdoor, their farms, their cattle. That's what's going out there. So they're tending and doing activities in all these areas. And they have a strong social connections. And one of the last podcasts we talked about was dementia and brain health. And we talked about that strong social connection for mental health and and brain activity and brain health. One theory is that we lose our cognitive ability and our brain function, and that leads to the deterioration of the entire body very quickly. So this can happen in our 50s, 60s, 70s. And once that starts to happen, it's a very fast decline as far as active daily living. And we start to lose that ability and we lose our quality of life. And typically when that starts to happen, everyone, even myself, we get depressed. And once that happens, it's a, it's a quick way to the end. So these strong social connections that have been researched through these blue zones have shown to have such dramatic benefits in our health that they play a role in longevity. They actually, you want to stay alive for longer. You have something to be around for. So when we joke about, oh, I don't want to make it that far because we don't think we don't, we don't want to make it to 80. We don't want to make it to 90. Well, heck, we don't want to make it to 100 if that's the case. These people get to 90 years old and they're like, my goodness, this is, I love my life. I want to keep going. So they have a purpose. And that's number four is the purpose that they have in their life. They feel like they're making a difference in the world and their lives have a meaning. Huge, huge source and purpose leads to wanting to connect socially, which if you want to connect socially, you're going to want to be active. You've got to be active to get there to the social gatherings, whether it's sitting with a cup of coffee with your friends, whatever it may be. And then if you're active, you're going to have to fuel yourself. And these zones decide to fuel themselves with a rich plant-based diet. It's cool how that whole cascade happens. It all starts with purpose. They have a purpose in their life to move forward. Go back to one of the very first podcasts I did about my dad's story um, and and beating cancer. If you want to talk about purpose, um, there you go. Having a bigger purpose than yourself can push you to unbelievable charted areas, which is very cool. So these blue zones are very cool. Um, It's important to note that, you know, there's, there is no one size fits all answer to all this. We know that uh, when it comes to studying longevity, but the research is actually very, very dedicated to what these people do. Okinawa, Japan is is a cool area on on one of the blue zones. 
um, where they really focus on diet. Um, their diet, centurions ate from. Here's what centurions in Okinawa, Japan, ate for most of their lives. This you're gonna you're gonna enjoy this. Sixty seven percent of their diet was made of sweet potatoes, yams. Twelve percent of their diet was rice. Nine percent was all the other vegetables. Six percent were legumes, just legumes, and then three percent were other grains, other types of grains aside from rice. And only 2% of their diet was fish, meat, and poultry. And 1% was other stuff, probably probably a little bit of sugar, you know, some sweets. But uh, that was, isn't that crazy? Like pretty much you're having sweet potato for lunch, you're having sweet potato for dinner uh, with some rice and some beans or, or whatever's growing uh, as far as legumes around you. Um, they eat a lot of soy. They eat a lot of tofu. It's very interesting the things that we pick up in our culture saying tofu is bad for you, soy is bad for you, it's an estradiol. And then you take a seat back and you talk about things from around the world, lo looking at it from a bigger lens. And from my family being Italian, my dad is directly from Italy, my mom is directly from Greece, gives me a very different pers perspective as being a first generation. I'm actually a first generation Canadian, but also live here in America. But being first generation outside of that area, that Mediterranean type lifestyle, and you sit there and you look, you're like, these people are doing something right when it comes out there. And for them, it was, it was, you know, the plant-based, the plant-based diets. So, and they make up a lot of it and looking at these things and they, they would laugh like, you know, they won't look at things like soy or caffeine or, and, and point blame to these things because they would cook food in their kitchen. So it was really hard to make saturated fats or trans fats in the kitchen because you wouldn't be using rancid oils. You'd be using natural oils from the farm. You'd be using avocado, probably not avocado in Italy, you'd be using olive oil, olive oil. And you'd be cooking it at a low heat and you'd be cooking your food in the house and the house would smell good. There wasn't much frying in these communities. And if it was, it was right there on top of the stove done with olive oil, really. So we weren't doing these things and they don't talk and they never talked about, you know, don't eat the bad stuff. Of course they said, don't smoke. That's bad for you. Don't consume alcohol. That's bad for you. These were the things I was listening in these cultures was that they repeated the, the things that are truly bad. But when it came to food, they said, enjoy all food, but they enjoyed the base so well, like the Greeks, they enjoy the, the vegetables so much like vegetables is the 90% of their diet. They love cooking it. They love eating it raw. They eat most of it raw. They cook the orca. They love orca. They love cooking spinach. They love um, their tomatoes in Italy and, and Greece, their olives. These are the things that they just base every meal off of. They could have a horyatiki salad every lunch and every dinner every day. It's because you could base that with anything, maybe with a little bit of chicken, a little bit of fish. It would totally be fish 90% of the time when it came to meat and 10% of the time would be Chicken, maybe beef, because in those parts, especially on the islands, beef is expensive, cattle is expensive, pork is expensive. Um, so they would they would be very infrequent to eat this stuff. And when you look at the blue zones all the way around the uh, around the world, even in Okinawa, pork is expensive. So you, they would have a little bit of that. And same thing in Costa Rica, M meats and cattle are expensive. So maybe that plays a role there as well. In, in California, a very different type of group are centurions, and they are the Seventh-day Adventists, believe it or not, who believe in eating a vegetarian diet. They're the only one out of all of those blue zones that do that, but they also play a huge social connections belief that they have to be around people and have good friendships and meaningful relationships with people. That was their base, and they stayed active with them. They would play uh, boche, uh, bochi, they would play um, lawn darts, they would just be out there in their 90s socializing and having fun. So these are things we can learn from the Blue Zones and Centurions, and what we can do moving forward is really focus on what matters and stop focusing on the blame. Stop focusing on what is bad. We know what is bad. We, we are past the point of uh, giving advice of, hey, stop smoking. We know that. Stop vaping. We know those these things are bad. Stop drinking colored sodas. Yeah, we know. I think everyone knows that. And doing podcasts about how bad they are 
isn't going to do any difference because people have the right to make their own choices. And as long as we're stupid enough to let commercialism continue to stock shelves with this and continue to buy it, then they're going to continue to produce this stuff. As long as we stop using this stuff, then there'll be no money to be made and they'll stop making that stuff and they'll make different, different things there. But as long as it's there, it's cheap to make and they make a killing selling these things in volume, right? Sodas and all that. So they focus, these five groups focus on the good. They focus on the things they should do and not on the things that they should not do. I thought that was always very interesting when it came to studying these. They always fascinated me. And it, the, I didn't even know, you know, California had one for a long time or Costa Rica. It was, it was, I, I always knew the zones in the Mediterranean and Sardinia and, and, and Kithira, these, these islands, where people live a long, a long time. And that, that was very cool to, to grow up in and visit these places and just listen to the lingo. And as, as a kid growing up, you didn't really pick it up. But now when you reflect back, you're like, man, those people just, they spoke different, they walk different and they did, they acted different uh, with everything, how they looked at healthcare, how they looked at taking care of themselves, self-care, mental health care, uh, and just always wanting to be around someone. This, you know, I grew up pre-social media time, so so those were my experiences growing up there. Now with social media, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how the new generations grow up there. But if they're surrounded with those types of eating habits and food habits and social habits, I think they're going to do great as well. And we can do great here. We can create and replicate those things right here because we have access to so much. And sometimes having access to so much makes it really easy to make bad choices. Uh, which is no one's fault. We all we all can take the easy route sometimes and buy a packaged good or a packaged food, but but we know the basis and, and what we need to do to live a longer, healthier lives. So I thought that was fan, uh, fascinating to study the blue zones. Look more into the blue zones. Uh, research that for yourself. You're going to learn some great stuff and what they do, but the uniqueness of them all all around the world makes it very cool. Hope that was an entertaining podcast. Stay healthy, stay well, do the right things as much as you can. And enjoy all the little things too, social connections and a purpose in life to reflect on that. And, you know, in our society, people are like, oh, I don't know even how to find out my purpose. Maybe you won't. Maybe all it takes is to show some gratitude and gratefulness for the things that are happening at this very moment. And I'm grateful for you. Have a great rest.